Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric. I'm here in a studio with Michael, not in a log cabin, which right. is probably where we should be doing the show today. Yeah. And uh, we got two films that are, well, one film and one thing that's kind of a film that I'm just going to wedge into our show because I really like it. Yeah, so like, what you are did, those? like you did that other time with Dr. Uh, Dr. Horrible. Dr. Horrible. Yeah, that went well. Yeah. I mm. hope that's not foreshadowing for this conversation. Boy, oh boy. Yeah, we're going to do The Shining and Bright Falls. Maybe next year for year four when we do the shows, we can just rent a cabin somewhere. And just go through shows and live like hermits and go to the little oh dear diner. Right. Uh, you and I used to do a lot of uh, constructive, creative stuff in diners. That was yeah, our we did. that was our office space before we yep. started recording things. Mm-hmm. I don't know if should we record something in a diner. I think that would probably just be really distracting. It would be, but I don't know. I mean, why don't you send us an email if you think that if <laughs> you don't think you'd be annoyed by the sounds of clinking and disgruntled patrons while it could be good atmosphere and it could just be bad it it would kind of it kind of sounds similar to like a laugh track maybe we could do our year end there that'd be fantastic Um, we could like get some lavalier microphones or something and do that Uh, anyways so there's probably a lot of different themes that you would see between the two movies. What was the original idea when we were setting this up? I guess the original idea is kind of being at the mercy of your surroundings. Yeah, I mean, sure. you wanted to do Bright Falls, so we kind of had the, to figure the out... The theme is short thing, long thing. Yeah. That's what the real theme right. is. Right. Yeah, Bright Falls is short, and uh, as I mentioned in the previous episode, you know, it's often compared to things like Twin Peaks and a lot of the David Lynch stuff. There's even a couple Lost comparisons. But I, and rather than do it with something like Firewalk with me or another David Lynch thing or, or something very Twin Peaks inspired, I thought we would kind of go the Stephen King direction, and that would give us an opportunity to just completely shelve that conversation. Right. We wouldn't need to talk about it because it's just obviously yeah. right there. And that's good for Bright Falls, but I think that's also good for The Shining. The Shining may be the most discussed movie I think we have it's ever easily. Clockwork Orange, a lot of people talk about, but I think yeah, we hit I on the that, central stuff with that. I think that Clockwork Orange, the difference between Clockwork Orange and The Shining, as you're going to hear throughout this podcast, is mm-hmm. I think Clockwork Orange earns a lot of the conversation. Yeah, the stuff with The Shining, I mean, it's it just seems Do like you conversation. See it? it's, yes. it's, it's, I'm not sure it's all there. The Clockwork Orange, a lot of the conversation deals with the subject matter and the right. plot and the story, right. which isn't. It's, it has nothing to do with Kubrick. And now we have the Stephen King story, which, take it or leave it, I guess. Today, we're both going to leave the yeah, Stephen no King. no Stephen King today. Uh, to the side. You know, we'll do a really heavy Stephen King episode later. We'll do, uh, what? give me two great Stephen King movies. Misery's really good. Okay, and what do we pair that with? John Carpenter did that car one, Christine. Okay, so we'll do Christine and Misery, and then we'll just talk about Stephen King a whole fucking episode. So great, so we don't have to tackle that, but we still have a very daunting effort in talking about The Shining, because, I mean, just look at the the fucking, just Google The Shining, and billions, I believe it's one billion results mm-hmm. come up. Uh, there are so many different papers about The Shining, huge essays that we could not even read in the in the time we have for our show. So I think we need a different angle to kind of attack that with. Do you have a plan of action for that? Well, I, I think the best thing to talk about with The Shining is going to be to talk about it as a Kubrick creation. Okay. And kind of... I guess what we're going to have to do is weed out the Kubrick from the the King. All right, you know what I mean. We'll yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. we'll talk about the film as a film and try to leave what came out of the book or what the book may sure. have done. We'll kind of leave that at the door. I mean, we're not going to be able to go without saying something. Sure, but sure. we'll definitely give the bulk of the discussion to the film version. You know what I think would be good if we could try and focus on what people if we could talk about what people say about the yeah, Shining that's a as good well. Idea. So we could give you an idea of. You know, maybe as a launch pad, if you really want to know more about The Shining, you hear a a bunch of this stuff here. We kind of give you an idea of these different perspectives, and then you can sort of go off and look into that because we it's just so far out of the scope of what we're doing. If you want to hear a lot of really heavy Kubrick stuff, you know, we mentioned we'll do the Stephen King stuff. For the Kubrick stuff, we did Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah. We did that on the first year, and that was a little bit more how do we feel about it kind of stuff. But I think we really hit it when we did A Clockwork Orange and uh, what was it? Elephant we did yeah. that with, right? Anyways, we have some spoilers and we have some chapters. So uh, we're going to spoil both of these films. 
Um, we're not going to get too heavy into the Bright Falls stuff. I think you need to see that over and over. But we're definitely going to spoil everything from The Shining that you've already seen parodied mm-hmm. everywhere else. Spoil it like the back of a naked old lady in a bathtub. You're already doing it. So uh, if you don't want to hear The Shining spoilers and you just showed up to... <laughs> no one no one did this. But if you did, just show up to uh, hear Bright Falls, skip over that. If you haven't had a chance to check out Bright Falls yet, you can skip over the Bright Falls section and see what we're doing next time on the show, which will not be Stephen King stuff. We're going to find something else to do next time. So how's this for a double feature opening for The Shining? What's going on with the SD and HD stuff here? Yeah. The DVD, widescreen, what the fuck? I, we had this conversation. We There's a the helicopter. It's the okay. helicopter you that, kind of, that, that yeah. kind of sparked the conversation. But you see a helicopter in one of the shots while the cars the blade runner shots apparently right. <laughs> um, yeah i think we mentioned this previously on the show in one of the other 500 episodes where we talked about blade runner keep sending those emails guys it's going to happen someday but they did use some of the uh they call them outtakes or unused footage from the shining but it's the same you know the helicopter shots of going right. down the road in the opening was used in the theatrical cut of blade runner to give you the studio ending so what you're talking about with this helicopter is apparently in the full frame, in the 3 by 4 square TV version of The Shining, you can see the shadow of a helicopter. And this is a hotly contested issue over whether or not this is a, a movie goof, because as the movie is intended to be seen in 16 by 9 in uh, widescreen, you don't see the helicopter. It's cut off because it's over there in the bottom corner. So you might be saying to yourself, wait, the widescreen version is cut off. How does that make any sense? So Kubrick filmed this movie in 4x3, in full screen, with the intention of not using the top and bottom of the frame. He thought that when they, you know, the projectionists at the theaters, that would be their instructions to show it in 16 by 9 1.85 to 1. And thusly, the top and the bottom of the frame would be cut off. He didn't mind this because as he filmed it, he looked at the top and bottom of his frame and said that part's not important. But uh, for whatever reason, he chooses to shoot his movies in that aspect ratio. So now the movie comes out. It's all these years later. The, all the video releases have been in the full frame because they consider that the pure. That's how yeah, it was shot, right? right? That's the pure version to watch it. When it looks like the intentions of the cinematographer and Stanley Kubrick were always to say, fuck the top and bottom of the frame. Those don't really matter. So it's become this this hotly contested thing. Do you watch it in widescreen or full? We actually watched the full screen version, Mm -hmm. although it seems like Stanley Kubrick thinks the official version is the one you would see in cinemas would Uh be the, the widescreen version of the film full screen or widescreen. We're dealing with the same content, the same icons. You've seen this stuff parodied over and over. Oh yeah. It pops up. What do you you think? (laughs) Yeah. I can't think of anything to say here. Uh, I love that part of child's play. That's a really great line. What are the big ones? Well, there's that. There's the Jack Nicholson's face through the door, yeah. looking to the left. There's uh, that. That's the infamous "Here's Johnny." The Here's scene. Johnny scene. So what I really love about that is actually right before that scene where he's swinging the axe, and the camera uh, it doesn't follow the total arc of the axe. It just whips left and right, so you feel almost as if the camera is bludgeoning the door the way the axe is. It's just really effective camera work. And then another one you have. Uh... Danny on the on the big wheel mm-hmm. riding around through the kitchen and over the carpet right, and right. The, the sound of the carpet and the hardwood floor alternating. Sure. Love that. And then the twin girls is a huge one. Yeah, we see the twins a few different times. Um, the the second time we see them, I believe, is in the, the first one is after the bathroom scene of Danny. There's that early shot where he's in the bathroom and then you have the blood from the elevator coming out and then just the brief flash of the twins. I would call this an honorable scare shot. I think this is a scare shot that really works to, um, we'll get to some stuff later. I think probably when we do P2, we'll talk about uh, different methods for scare shots. That seems like a good show to do that. But this is, and part of what will frame our conversation, is I think we're both on the same level of talking about how The Shining is... A uh, pulls off the (laughs) you and I actually had a huge conversation before we even started recording about what genre the shining even is. Uh, But if we were to call it a horror film, just for the sake of not rehashing that conversation, I think we would both agree that it's effective because it doesn't know the genre very well. Right, exactly. The things it does are very unlike what is typical. The best, the best, there are two things that can make a filmmaker make a fantastic horror film, Mm -hmm. the perfect horror film. 
One is the Stanley Kubrick method, which is you don't know horror. Yeah. So you're making a film with horror elements. Yeah. The other is the Rob Zombie method, where you know horror so fucking well <laughs> yeah. that you know which elements are betrayable and which elements to hold on to. Yeah, right. And that's why The Shining fits into the horror genre as a great piece, because it's not redoing all the stuff mm -hmm. that horror movies always do. Both of those, I think, you could look at as commentaries of the genre themselves. That's what a lot of people said about The Shining when it came out, that it's almost a criticism of horror fans, you know, the way they show up to movies and want to see blood and gore, almost that it's it's telling them they should feel bad about that because of how, uh, not necessarily how reserved it is, but in, okay, so look at this, this early shot of, you know, the blood from the elevator. I mean, nothing's loud, nothing's abrasive. There aren't the, the usual thing we see with scare shots where, you get a loud noise to indicate the scare has happened. Right. That's the point where you get startled on that. But instead, it's just slow. It's creepy. It's uh, very ominous. You know, the music's very ominous. When you first see that shot, the blood in the elevator is repeated a couple of times, but you almost don't even know what you're looking at. It's just what's going on with the elevator over there. And then as it starts to pour out, you realize that it's blood. But still, it's just about your skin crawling. You're waiting. Uh, maybe this is just as a modern audience. I feel like this, but... You're waiting for the startle moment. You're waiting for the almost the release mm -hmm. uh, as if all of this tension is going to build up and then something scary and instantaneous and immediate will happen and then you will know the scare is over. But what's even more uncomfortable, I think, is that you never get that release. It just kind of dissolves. The blood eventually fills the entire hallway and then you move on to another scene and you don't know if the scary stuff is right. over. Because it, there wasn't a moment, an eek moment where you're like, oh, we can all have a That's laugh. We all got scared. Right. Yeah. Instead, it builds up and then it just kind of goes back down. And you're left with an uncomfortable feeling as if you didn't finish that it's scene. It's kind of like, I don't know if it happens to you, but it's kind of like when you're on a fucking CTA bus and the bus driver stops so slowly that you don't feel the bus <laughs> kick back. Right. So you think yeah. you're just you going to roll for it. into sure, the intersection. Sure. And it's not until you're halfway down the road when you realize that that's just never going to happen yeah. it's over now and time to move you on. wait for the bus to stop finally and yes. give you the kickback you need which yeah. the shining does once or twice maybe i think it probably doesn't even do that until you get the end credits then you just know everything is over until then it's all just you know peaks and valleys as far as how tense the movie is going to be you don't have specific moments where you have uh something jumping out at you to to give you that kind of release the woman in the bathroom is another scene I remember uh, yeah. from The Shining, but not one that I knew about before I saw The Shining mm -hmm. the first time. Probably just because it's graphic. Uh, yeah. You don't see it. And right. It's not as easy to parody on, say, The Simpsons in yeah. the way that a lot of the other scenes are. But that's a very Kubrick shot. You know, well, first of all, you have the bathroom thing, which we've never talked about. But for some reason, we're seeing it in all these Kubrick movies. Mm -hmm. We saw it in Eyes Wide Shut. We see it in a lot of these movies. Uh, the bathroom is a place that Kubrick returns to over and over in his films. Uh, and there's always pivotal kind of plot moments in there or something that it's meant to tell you something specifically about the characters in a place that the camera doesn't go. But that's not the reason I feel like that's not the only reason this is Kubrick stuff. You also get the full on nudity. Mm -hmm. You're in a bathroom. You have the fully naked woman, very eyes wide shut. I just mm -hmm. keep going back to the right. images. The What were some of the most iconic images from that? And then you also have, you cut back to Jack Nicholson, and he's looking up at you from his brow. Uh, that same scene that you see, yeah. uh, every single one of Kubrick's protagonists yeah. do this, where, don't they? But The Shining is a really good example of this because Jack Nicholson perfects the look. Yeah, he Jack does. Jack Nicholson is one of it's the most naturally creepy men <laughs> yeah. in Hollywood. Those eyebrows, what are they I mean, doing? We saw, him, we saw him do probably what I would consider his least creepy role in Easy, Easy Rider. Easy Rider, sure. But now he is, he's just notorious for kind of being a little bit off, yeah. you know? The Departed is another good example where mm -hmm. he's he's never psychotic. Unless he's playing the Joker. Then right, he's psychotic. exactly. Um, but a lot of times he's just a little off kilter. That same bathroom scene is also doing some of the stuff we see modern horror capitalize on uh, when you go to something like Hostel. Mm -hmm. The sexy meets, oh my God, dangerous, what is happening? Right. You can see this in Jack's expression. He comes up, he's intrigued by the naked woman, he wants to make out with her. And then all of a sudden, uh, the naked woman is a rotting corpse. And that's part of the terror of luring you into the... It would have been enough to see a corpse coming out of the bathroom, kind of scary. 
that's what the elevator shots are doing. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, look at this lovely elevator music, a bunch of blood. Uh, you know, you're in a sexy moment with an intriguing woman in the ghost woman hotel stuff. And then all of a sudden that turns into the complete polar opposite of that. What makes that scene even worse is that it's juxtaposed against shots of Danny. Right. So you have all of this fucked up stuff going on with his dad. And then the fact that it's sexual in nature and it keeps flashing back to this young boy's Foaming messed up <laughs> voice, or messed up face rather. Yeah, it's just uh, it just continues to push you in directions you don't want to go. You mentioned all work and no play makes Jack a doll boy. Um, I don't know if this is one of the things people remember from The Shining. You know, it's not one of the icons you. The phrase certainly is. Yeah. But the scene where there, uh, where Wendy, his wife, is flipping through the manuscript. I think I just love that as a prop because yeah. it's really there and they just had to spend all that time well, typing it up. But the other thing that you have to consider is, yeah, okay, so you have this crew that spends all this time typing it up, but the implication there is that Jack actually spent all that time <laughs> right, typing it up. Right, he gets the credit for it. Well, but you have to consider the fact that he's sitting there, so assuming, you know, back into the story and less as a prop. Right. He's been sitting there for, for days yeah. just typing this. And the interesting part isn't that he's been typing it over and over. The The sheet in the typewriter is just line, enter, line, enter, line, yeah. enter, or return as it was on the typewriter. Yeah. Um, Unless they're putting it in uh, in quotes or right. phrasing it. In yeah. a, it. It looks like haikus on yeah. some of the and pages. Yeah, so then later on you see that he's been writing. It seems like he doesn't realize. Yeah. It seems like he thinks he's been writing a novel, yeah. but he doesn't know what's coming out. Well, and then you talked about that real world element that makes it. When we did Small Soldiers, we talked about that flaming tennis ball yes. stuff. How that was just great because the way to accomplish that shot is to light a tennis ball on fire <laughs> and whack it back through a window. But you know that someone actually sat there typing out this giant manuscript. Right. And then to have it featured so prominently yeah. in the movie is well, good that's too. That's success right there. You're really capitalizing on it at page after page after page. You know it's there. You know it's tangible. You're. It's as if you're holding it in your own hands, investigating it past the point a normal movie well, you would. Keep wanna, you would continue to yes. look at the page yeah, and go, would. okay, well, how many pages of this has he really... <laughs> when did he stop how, writing yeah. the book? Right. And you realize slowly that he was never writing a novel. And that helps you realize what a fucking psychopath he is. That level of... Uh, I wouldn't even call it dedication because it's so unintentional for right. him. So the final icon I want to talk about is like, it's the penultimate icon for me. Do you mean penultimate this time? We got an angry email. Yeah, about it. So I've just never corrected you on this because in my mind, I always kind of retrofit. Sure. Penultimate is second to ultimate. Right. It's the one before the ultimate. Every time you say penultimate, I, in my head, although you probably mean to talk about the ultimate right. one, I always think, well, may maybe Michael's referring yeah. to this imaginary I'm one. usually wrong, aware. but this time I'm correct. Okay, so you mean the, the second to best scene right. that you... Okay, the best right. scene for me is the Here's Johnny scene. Got I it. love it. I love the axe. I love Crazy Jack Nicholson. I love sure. Shelley Duvall screaming, holding the oh, knife. God, she's great. But my second favorite scene is the whole scene where Dick Halloran comes in. And I, I mean, we were talking about the movie starts and we see Dick Halloran and I'm already telling you the best part of this movie is when yep. Dick Halloran comes in to save the day and dies instantly. Yeah, almost as if by accident. And exactly. It's kind of, it almost seems like Jack comes around the corner, accidentally bumps into him with <laughs> yeah. the ax. Yeah. But then what follows is you get Jack has finally killed. Yeah. And he goes limping down the hallway, holding the bloody ax. That scene with yeah, Jack right, Nicholson right. limping and that wide shot of the hallway is one of my favorite moments in the movie. Killing that character is so perfect, too, because it's uh, it's this almost sense of humor the film has that we debate. Uh, we debated as we were watching the film whether it kind of had a sense of humor right. about these things. Because it presents to you in the... I mean, it's the whole... It's called The Shining. Mm -hmm. Here is a character who talks to the young boy about The Shining. And that connection they have, that mental connection, is really only going to come back one time at the end of the film. And it's only going to come back long enough for Jack to kill him and say, that didn't matter, moving yeah. right along. Well, it seems like, you know, the, the their savior, the one thing yes. that's going to save them sure. is The Shining. The Ahab, as we talked about with exactly. the rise of Leslie Vernon behind the mask. But what you fucking realize is that the one thing that's going to fuck them over is The Shining. Yeah. It's the fact that this hotel is basically calling the shots and that it knows what's going on and it may or may not be controlling Jack Torrance. That's not important. The point is you realize that The Shining, as you saw it, is actually a negative aspect to the film. 
And while it represents that joke, I think it also represents, you know, The Shining isn't pointing directly to that joke. I think it's pointing to the house stuff you're talking about. It's pointing to the uh, the character of that hotel. And, you know, this might be a good time to talk about a couple of these interpretations because I think we'll get around to what we think is ultimately our interpretation of, and where the... Um, where the focus of this film lies yeah. for us. But I mean, you're all over the board with this. So you have the Native American stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's an Indian burial ground. Apparently, right? it's an in- they'd, re- they'd redecorate the hotel sure. so it looks like American Indian stuff. And there's a couple little bits of dialogue that indicate it might be a commentary on that. But yeah. that stuff doesn't jump out to me too much. I mean, there's a lot of, I guess what, that's why the hotel's haunted? Sure. Yeah, Fine. sure. That's the That's the point of that. But in the dialogue, you could read into some of those lines as a criticism of... You know, colonization by uh, of Western culture. Yeah, and revenge. Red man's revenge. A lot of people also tell you this is a look back at fears of the Holocaust and of nuclear war. And every time I hear that, I mean, I have a really hard time straining to put those things. Yeah. To, do you see any of that in this For, film? I mean, the biggest, most obvious thing about The Shining that parallels both of those events is the high body count. Yeah. And you don't ever see the high body count, but you know that all the people that you see, particularly the scene where he walks into the bar and it's a swell party. Yeah. That scene is full of dead people. Yes. That's a mass grave Mm -hmm. at that point. And so, yeah, there's a Holocaust thing. And I guess you could also say the Holocaust is the hotel influencing a once innocent man to do, you know, kill other innocent people because of its own, you know, agendas, whatever. Well, that's one of the things that you come away from the movie kind of curious about. I mean, there's a lot of big stuff. But when you want to get into uh, more philosophical points, you talk about the difference between influence versus possession. Right. I mean, if he is fl- <laughs> a thing you can never talk about in real life because possession doesn't exist. But in a ghost story, that's one of the things talking about the nuance of those almost reminds me of Hellraiser. Right. Right. The first Hellraiser, we talked about uh, some similar stuff yeah. there. But not flat out possession. Yeah. But here we're dealing with is Jack Nicholson's character possessed or is the house just influencing? Yeah. Does he have any right. control to well, go back and there's, on? And we kind of discussed the scene that still bothers the hell out of me when the ghost open unlocks the door. Yeah, right. That bothers the hell out of me because it begs the question, if the house can open things, if the house can move objects, why doesn't it just fucking throw a knife at these people it wants to kill? Right. That's beside the point. But what does happen is if the house had possessed him, There wouldn't need to be that conversation where the house makes him promise to kill his family, that kind of thing. So, I mean, maybe that's there's that aspect. We'll return to that point because I have uh, kind of an idea about that. So don't let me forget that. Uh, With this Holocaust stuff, I mean, it comes up a lot in Kubrick's films. I feel like that's less intentional on his part. And I think that's more, you know, he's had a long interest in wanting to do a film about the Holocaust. Could never really find the right angle to do that. So I think you see those interests of his kind of leak into his work, although not necessarily intentional. Right. I don't know if you walk away from The Shining thinking about the Holocaust, but if you start thinking about the Holocaust and watch The Shining, then maybe you could find a lot of that stuff. And that's you know what a lot of the analysis of the film does. Mm-hmm. Kind of starts with the premise and tries to use The Shining to fit into that. We talked about casting shame on an audience that comes to horror films for violence and death. Fuck you. Um, yeah, seriously. But uh, also, and one of the themes I kind of like is this call for community. I mean, you could talk about that with the Cold War fear uh, might be about the right time for that to say, you know, with the Cold War, countries are branching off and trying to uh, stay in their own little bubbles, not communicate, no commerce between the the different uh, countries, no business going on there. And I think that's something that uh, the Overlook Hotel could be a metaphor for I mean... they're staying in this hotel. They talk about cabin fever a little bit. Um, I like that because it appeals to the psychological side and not sure. so much the supernatural side that perhaps these people are uh, – a lot of people come away from this movie saying these people are imagining all this stuff. Right. That Jack is imagining all this stuff and being isolated without community, without you know peer review and an outside perspective – that he is allowed to just go completely crazy. Mm-hmm. And if that says something about Jack, what does that say about, you know, the Cold War? Which is a good point to launch into stuff, but I guess there's also the study of the American dream, the breakdown of the family unit. Yeah. Uh, I feel like the family unit's breaking down before they even get to the Overlook Hotel. I think there's a little television. There's a little television. Yeah, there's there. some TV you get stuff. The, you get the really snotty remark from Jack <laughs> right. Nicholson. You hear that, honey? Yeah. He saw it on television. Your Jack Nicholson's pretty good, Thank but you. it's also got some George W. Bush in there, too. Yeah, little, it's the same guy. A little guy. tinge of that. Sorry. 
I guess when you're going off and reading a lot of this analysis, the only thing I would advise people to look for is if at any time during the analysis, the writer feels the need to point out that Red Rum is murder backwards, you can instantly discount everything else they have to say. That's the best way to read into this. But uh, let's stick with this isolation stuff. Let me just ask you the question, because we often humor these not necessarily fan theories, but alternate looks at sure. you know how you when we talked about Rosemary's Baby too. or the Prestige. Yeah. So here's here's the point I wanted to get at: when people say this is all in Jack's head, is that the Prestige or is that Rosemary's Baby? I think that's a little bit the Prestige. Twenty yeah. minute ice cream, man. Oh, twenty minute ice cream yeah. is a perfect. Okay, so let me set this up so people understand the context of what we're talking about here. Fans of this film fight tooth and nail to say that the ghosts in the film are not real. And they use uh, different pieces of evidence. I mean, one of the big ones is they point out that, you know, every time Jack talks to ghosts, there's always mirrors. Yeah. So maybe he's talking to himself in the mirror. You know, you go through the entire film and you say, the ghosts don't have to be real here, here, and here. This is just a story about cabin fever, about people being secluded and how that makes you insane. But 20 minute psychic ice cream just kind of, is that a good phrasing for that? 20 yeah, minute psychic ice cream kind of d- disproves yeah. that. So before Danny's suitcase is even unpacked, we talk about ice cream a little bit. How does that disprove? What does ice cream have okay. to do with the ghosts here? So essentially the thing is, is if you're going to dispel everything supernatural, you'd have to write off the fact that Danny also sees ghosts. Okay. And also does his mother. Because the they're not hanging around mirrors when those, this stuff happens. So that's fine. They've been in, when they're seeing ghosts, they've been in the you know hotel just as long as Jack has. Okay. Maybe they're kind of seeing you know a little bit of the same you know cabin fever, a little bit of the insanity right. setting in. The problem lies in The Shining. So you have this conversation between Scatman Crowther's character, um, yeah. Dick, and Danny, where they're discussing what The Shining is. And you propose to me that maybe they're just, he's kind of priming Danny, you know, things get crazy in here when you're alone, you need to kind of keep control of yourself. A metaphor for cabin fever. Exactly. He's talking about... Uh, and Susceptibility to cabin fever, I Sure, guess. he's warning him about that. But and, that's not really the case, is it? Well, it can't be because even before this conversation, when they're less than, they're less than, this is why it's called 20 minute psychic ice cream. They've not been at the Overlook for more than 20 minutes. Danny hasn't unpacked his suitcase here. And, and Dick Halloran looks at him and says, how about some ice cream, Doc? With his brain. Yes. He says it with his brain. Psychically. So Danny's not there nearly long, even if that were an effect. There's still other workers of, at the right. fucking hotel. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. So they're not even set into seclusion yet. So this is one, not an effect of seclusion because we've seen it happen far before those effects would even set in. But two, it's more about the 20 minute psychic ice cream conversation. They sit down and he says, hey, just now I talked to you with my brain, didn't I? Well, I mean, that scene would not be in there if you're meant to look at this film in a way, you're meant to look at something like perhaps Rosemary's Baby, right. where it could work on several levels. There is only one level that this film works on. And I understand what people are trying to do. They want to push the ghosts out. They, they want to make push it psychological. Yeah, and I just, that's not, it's not working here at all. Even Stanley Kubrick says that there are ghosts in the film. There are really ghosts. The ghosts are not purely symbolic. They're not just psychological. There are actually ghosts in the hotel. And the physicality of those ghosts, that's part of what he wanted to do with The Shining. So you would not only have to resist the characters of Wendy and Danny, you would also have to resist the people who created the film, you know, the intentions that they meant to go forward with. I think The Shining is probably the ultimate example of reading into things that aren't there. We talked about that with all the analysis. That's not what the evidence points to. If you're going to look at this as evidence-based, don't fucking talk. It's it's evidence or faith at this mm-hmm. point, right? You're going you're gonna to talk about evidence, and that's going to show you that ghosts are actually in the hotel. But if you're going to talk about, well, I want to believe that there are the ghosts are all fake in this movie, right. then don't start talking about mirrors and stuff, because right. then you come back into evidence territory. It's really weird for me to use the skeptical perspective to show you signs that ghosts actually exist. In the film, people, just in the film. All right, so then what's happening in this? If it's not, we've kind of been beating around what the actual point of the film is. I think the basic idea here is that the Overlook also has The Shining. Yes. And so knowing that 
Danny may have some kind of insight. Maybe it wants to wipe Danny out. Maybe it doesn't even make a target of them. It just wants right. to kill them for whatever reason. But let's say it wants to take out Danny. It also takes out Halloran because he too has the shining. Let's say the hotel wants to wipe out everybody with the shining. Okay. That's the hotel a possibility. Has the shining. And so it influences Jack to kill his family. And this is why one, uh, Jack can find them all the time. Yeah. Because the hotel is essentially communicating with him. And two, why Jack ends up dying in the maze, which is actually one of two other things. One, he didn't go out with his family before to check the maze out. Right. And two, when he's not inside the house, he can't fucking... He's away from the properties of The Shining. Exactly. You know, I like that about supernatural stories, uh, where if you're going to have an element of the supernatural, you don't try and make me believe that it's happening in our world. Instead, you say supernatural stuff happens in the house that's in The Shining. When you leave the house, when you get too far away from the house, the powers of the magic house do not extend into the characters so that we can sit here in our studio completely unaffected by The Shining. But if we were to go to the Overlook Hotel, then we would feel the powers of that house. Um, that might stray a little bit when he starts communicating with uh, Dick a little bit mentally. Um, but I think there's other ways that Dick could have found out there was trouble in the house. I think there's evidence to support the theory that Dick found out about the the problems in the house through natural means. Well, you and... could even say that that Danny contacted Dick. The thing the thing about the the transference of the shining is that Jack does not have it. Okay. So if he's not in the house, if he's away from the immediate right. properties not of the house, not affected by the powers of the shining. The sure. house can't talk to him essentially. I mean, I feel like an idiot trying to perpetuate a fucking mm -hmm. talking house here isn't this great taking the other side it's should wonderful have, we should have done this with monster house or some shit so where are you really getting in trouble then is that last scene the super obvious scene um i've talked to uh i talked to somebody who was a huge fan of the shining a few days ago and we were kind of going back and forth about that scene because i originally watched the shining with uh, the the chick who produces this show and we were both kind of along for the ride. And then at the end, it was, oh, what that weird photograph, just hating you over the... It zooms in, and then it zooms in again, and then it zooms into his face. And then it, and then pans, it pans down. down to the fucking name of the hotel, and the, as if you couldn't get all that stuff yourself. So the girl I was talking with the other day, not our producer, but uh, somebody totally unrelated to that story, uh, was telling me that she thinks it's a sort of sense of humor that the film has almost in the same way that when you talk about why does the house want to attack these people, it's as if the house has a sense of humor. The house is playing a game. You know, the house doesn't just throw knives at these people like fucking poltergeist style because that wouldn't entertain the house. The house is there and secluded by itself. It gets this character. It gets Jack to come in and it wants to play a game with Jack. I also feel like Jack is possessed or influenced uh, influence possessed either way, specifically by one spirit. And so I think that, you know, it's the murder custodian, like you right, were talking about right. when we were watching the film. There is a murder custodian in the house. And so when someone like Jack shows up, his the influence that he feels or even the possession that he, he's getting is directly from that murder custodian. And so when he starts to have conversations, like when he first talks to the bartender about, you know, I've always liked you, that's showing that that's a point where he starts to be corrupted full on mm -hmm. you know that spirit or whatever is it you know the thing that's possessing him is starting to just talk to the bartender no longer is jack a part of that equation what i don't think or maybe i just don't want to think the ending is saying is that jack the man not the possessed demon jack or the influence jack but just regular old jack school was teacher always, from vermont jack. yeah was always in the house because that doesn't make any fucking sense he was raising a family outside of this so I feel like that last photo is just a way to kind of play with you and say, you know, all right, so it's Jack in the photo, but maybe Jack wasn't really there when right. the photo was taken. Whoever was the, the the custodian at that point is now the one who has taken over Jack himself. And that makes it a more human story again. It makes it a story about how this is a downward spiral. It's a person who has felt corruption by a dark presence and is fighting that off. And to go through the whole film watching Jack try and be a good father, but then the darkness brings him back to that point where he was an alcoholic, shitty dad. Yeah. I just think that's a much better story. And I think that works within the fiction of the film more than la la la, I can't see the ghosts. Don't don't bother me with supernatural shit. Okay, so we're kind of dealing with an isolation theme here. So 
I'm going to isolate you by moving you into Bright Falls because I don't really have nearly the the capacity that you have to discuss this thing. All right, so this is a little unfair to throw you into a conversation about Bright Falls because you've only seen it once. Bright Falls was almost constructed specifically to be watched over and over and analyzed and maybe even critiqued and pulled apart. Uh, And this is something you're seeing for the first time. So what I think we should do is just have a very surface conversation about this. There are places where you can find a far more in-depth one. Um, I've been doing a lot of writing. The website is brightfalls.blogspot.com. Something that when I found Bright Falls, I felt the need to just write insane theories and talk to other people and kind of get community, uh, get some kind of community going around that because I didn't know what the fuck was happening in this uh, this series. And so as the series went on, I would write up these full in-depth theories of what's going on in each episode And then fairly recently, I wrote up what I think is happening in the entire series. So the fun of Bright Falls is kind of figuring that out for yourself. It's almost like someone's handing you a puzzle that's already complete if you just read about that. But if you've seen it five or six times and you are just absolutely done with trying to figure it out, you're frustrated, you need hints, head over there and read some of that stuff. Bright Falls was something that was created as a tie-in to Alan Wake, Mm -hmm. which is both a novel and a video game. Uh, it was one of those things first, but if I say which one, half the people listening to this show will will skip over to the next time segment. But uh, the idea of creating Alan Wake was something, I think it's it's called a psychological action thriller. That's the tagline of the game. Okay. So it's meant to be something that's incredibly story-driven, very heavy, and that wears its influences on its sleeve. I mean, it's uh, it's about a writer writing stuff. He's writing within the story. It's what we saw with the Stephen King and uh, stuff in The Shining. Mm-hmm. So it's very Stephen King influenced. They talk about Stephen King a couple times in the story, and it's also got some pretty heavy influences of Twin Peaks yeah. and of Lost. Yeah. Now you can see some of those influences trickling over into Bright Falls, uh-huh. which is set up as a prequel to the events of Alan Wake. I mean, the Twin Peaks stuff, even without having seen Twin Peaks, yeah. you notice some oh, of that yeah, stuff, sure, right? Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. You've been watching something pretty recently that pulls from Twin Peaks, right? Yeah, there's this there's this show that kind of started in called Happy Town. Yeah. Watching Bright Falls, because you kind of, you bailed on Happy Town. Yeah, I did. I, I and, couldn't deal with it. And watching Bright Falls, see, this is what I see. Yeah. When I, I recognize I, that's what that I this thought. is that's not what what's airing on <laughs> right. television, right. but this is what I see in, right. my, in my twisted little brain. I mean, right. I'm also seeing fucking Eli Roth. Watching you are, yeah, Bright you Falls saw, too. Yeah, we've we've said the phrase cabin fever a thousand times without actually right. talking about the film. But yeah, there's uh there's some moments kind of from Cabin Fever. There's that some you might cabin fever. There's a few hostile moments too. Yeah. A lot of the character stuff when they bring in a new character where you're automatically afraid of them. Yes. That's something that you see a lot in hostile because there's a lot of outsider being brought into a completely new place and everybody could be involved in a conspiratorial thing. Right. You're not sure who to trust. And then the cabin fever thing is just kind of wandering out of the woods and and being in seclusion, but secluded in an area where there are other people. And it right. just turns out they can't help you. You're just sort of the outsider there. Exactly. So you're not, you can't really trust those yeah. people. Yeah. I think if I were to look at every single thing I like about Bright Falls, it's something that builds off of the setting. The setting comes first. Creating that environment comes first. And once you have that kind of setting, you can do a lot of different things with it. I mean, this is the kind of place that um, it was shot in Washington and uh, Washington State and Oregon. Yeah, because it, it looks like that episode of Fringe. Yeah, Washington. the episode of Fringe. Right, right. Um, that kind of away in the we saw it with Insomnia a little bit, too, although mm-hmm. that was in Alaska. Right, right. That same small town seclusion type of feel. What you often get in a lot of those cases, uh, Fringe did that a little bit, um, where it's almost a cynical look at that small town you're kind of making fun of the small town and the small-minded people from it, where I think Bright Falls gives them a lot of credit because you feel like maybe not all of the people, and we can talk about how, how many of the people, but some of the people, at least, a large number, are in on something, uh, you know, to go back to the David Lynch Blue Velvet stuff we talked about, where there's a seedy underbelly. Right. Something is happening in the town. These people aren't simpletons. They have some dark secret or something that's almost conniving and powerful, and you're just not in on that. And so I think that gives them a lot more credit than to say, oh, look at these, you know, fucking cops who don't know what they're talking about. And they just that scene at uh, in I think it's the sixth episode mm. in uh, Clear Cut is really exemplary of that. You have this deputy coming in 
and you don't know if he's stupid or playing. I mean, what do you think there? Because he starts talking about, you know, at that point, Jake has torn up this road. We're, we're not actually going to tell you what happens in Bright right, Falls. Right. So it just, it's on that website, brightfalls.blogspot.com. You can get it off brightfalls.com. It's everywhere. Just go watch it. It's like 25 minutes. In uh, the last part of it, Jake has torn up that room, and you think he's going to be found out. The deputy comes sure. in and looks at it. But what does the deputy end up saying? He thinks it's a a, a, a trophy buck. Yeah. A, a trophy animal. Well, yeah. that's one of the my favorite things. I lo- By the way, I didn't say this to you, but I loved that. Oh, good. I absolutely good, glad. loved Bright Falls. Fantastic. Um, but that's one of the things that I really enjoyed is that there's this constant overtone of everybody shoots a deer. Yep. There and you it's go. A town deer of, fest, it's right? It's a town of deer hunters. Yes. Yep. So there's kind of this overwhelming tendency for everybody to just kind of assume deer. He hits a deer. Yeah happens yep it's just everybody's i just like the notion that there's a town that's just so highly educated on on deers well it seems like deer fest is you even hear about it on the radio you know something when we get these radio djs and all these films we do talking about events coming up that's a a community thing that that is the celebration of the town it's the most important fucking thing is deer fest everyone's excited for deer fest and it's part of this layer maybe even this disguise of the town uh, which could be natural or could be a front. So when that deputy comes in and he starts talking about the deer, do you think he knows what Jake has done and he's kind of, is he playing stupid or I don't think does the he answer's actually, there? I yeah. mean, I, I think that, I think that, you know, that's one of those questions you kind of have to ask. And then I, I would have, cause I would have to go back again and rewatch it. Yeah. Cause I mean, off the top of my head, I would say he's got to be at least kind of in on it, but at the same time, maybe he's not. So he got bit. Exactly. Yeah. That's the thing is you see him before he gets bit and then he comes in and acts like that's never happened before he's right. completely new to that situation. So maybe he doesn't know what's going on or maybe he's playing it off that way. Maybe he put the two together. Right. You know, this crazy lady was going on and now this guy tore up his room. I, they're connected. Yeah. There's something very dark happening in the town. Uh, the town, almost in the way we talked about the Overlook Hotel, there is something almost possessing people or influencing people. There is a dark presence at work. And I feel like that's something that's relatively new. Perhaps it was there for a long time and it went away. All these people, see, you know, Sam, the the innkeeper, it's like he knows about it. He's going around replacing these light bulbs. He, uh, you know, he nods to Daniel, his son, um, to go get his vest or whatever, because in that scene in the uh, the third segment, he's replacing the light bulbs. He hears something in the woods. He makes a motion to his son, and his son goes and prepares the guns or gets the jacket together. So yeah. it's like they've taken care of this before. They're aware that this happens, but it doesn't happen often enough for them to keep a gun on them. Right. These people in this town aren't living in fear twenty four seven. But when something like they've this just, happens, they've adapted to being yeah. able to handle the situation. Right. They they coexist with it. Exactly. Some other pieces of the small town and the atmosphere you get. Uh, the first one is the birthday party scene uh, where he gets a cake. Jake gets a right. cake for no reason. Food he didn't order and a cake. And the entire Oh Dear Diner starts singing this miserable, monotonous. Happy birthday, happy yeah, birthday. Yeah, right. Which is the first moment where you know something's extremely fucked up. Uh, they're not handing it to you very heavily as they do in, in the second segment where you get the flashes. But you know something is off. That whole Oh Dear Diner being your only home in the town, the place you consistently return to, the only place you should feel comfortable, but you don't because the first time you were there, you got a weird happy birthday thing. Another part of the small town is uh, talking to the guy in the pharmacy, you know, when he buys the duct tape. Uh, That's another interesting thing there. The first time I saw that, I thought he was just buying a car part because he busted his headlight. But uh, I think if you watch it really closely, you see he's got a paper in hand. There's drugs behind the guy. I think he's trying to get his prescription refilled. And that guy starts talking about, well, it's going to take three, four, six days. It'll take about six days. And you start to realize you are really cut off from the outside. Mm -hmm. He can't even get somebody to, to drive this stuff in. So Jake has to get out. That's kind of the first moment you realize there's no hope for Jake here. He has to get his story he wants to learn about uh, Emil Hartman, the doctor. Right. So he he wants to get in there, get that information, and get out. And the entire time as the series is going on, you start to realize that all of the fucked up stuff that is happening is hitting closer and closer to home, uh, to Jake specifically. 
that all of these events sort of center around him. They're affecting him, not just, you know, you see Sam disappear. And then later, I think it's suggested that Sam's disappearance has something to do with Jake. Uh, we get all these flashes. Do you remember? Um, so again, I know this is the first time you've seen this here. Um, I've freezed framed these. So let's just talk about these these flashes here, this mystery stuff. The second episode, you get the first occurrence right. of the flashes. Really quick, a lot of different scenes. And it's when he's talking to Emil. Mm-hmm. Um, Emil starts talking about, well, you know, it all goes back to this yeah. is what I wrote in my book, blah, blah, blah. And he looks up at this painting, his eyes wander off, and you get what is really a terrifying scene of just scene after scene of weird stuff yeah. before he snaps out, realizes there's been some lost time. The only thing from those flashes that really stick, the only thing I can really remember is that sugar cube. Yeah, you get the sugar cube with the coffee sucking yeah. up into it. Um, the coffee just talking about, you know, staying awake or right. whatever. The other scene from that that you get is the the crazy woman. Right. So you don't even know if it's a woman or what's going on at that point. But you just see in front of some kind of bars or a jail or something. And you later, the series is pretty subtle about this, too. They don't feel the need to say, hey, remember back from that episode? I just love how much credit this gives to its audience. You see the crazy woman again. So it's almost like he's having a premonition Mm -hmm. or perhaps the timeline isn't as linear as we thought. And he's already seen that. You see the weird fucked up bunny rabbit laying on the ground. Uh, kind of twitching. So the second time I rewatched that, that really freaked me out because I had it on mute the second time because the noises are so jarring that it's hard to pay attention. And I didn't notice that the rabbit was still alive and it kind of twitches and freaks me out. And then you see um, his car skid into the deer and you see a deer head floating underwater. Maybe the same deer head that you see at the episode, the end of episode two, uh, that the guy in the blue jumpsuit is holding as he's walking along. So he takes all these crazy notes. There's a lot of cool stuff on that notepad. You can look that up. But then we get flashes again towards the end. Do you remember anything about that set of flashes? They're a little more chaotic. Not really. All right. So what you're seeing in that, a lot of different stuff. You see the flare. They're the uh, the set of flashes that end off the episode, and it's the siren, the blue right, and right. Uh, red stuff on the pavement, which ends up being kind of where the series ends. Those are the only two shots you get that are really premonition kind of stuff. All the other ones or most of the other ones are things that have happened. That's where you start getting clues about Sam because you realize that the stuff of that we saw earlier of the, the red moving dirt really quick, that's probably the red clay stuff on Mm -hmm. his hands. He's probably been out in the woods running around. Maybe he's the one who attacked the rabbit, you know, maybe he's attacking animals. Maybe he attacks Sam. I mean, that's the feeling I get seeing Sam pulled away because all these other shots seem to be from his perspective or at least of him. So I think we've explained a lot. We've tackled a lot of stuff on this from the series and then kind of given people it's a six part series. There's only the six parts. It's all that exists. So just go watch that stuff. You've seen this for the first time. And I know that uh, we did a couple different ARG things uh, that we kind of investigated at the same time when the kid the year zero one, right. um, there was a big one for lost, the lost experience. So the first time you see something like this and you know that it's loaded with stuff, when you rewatch it or go back, I mean, what do you look for? What advice would you give people who are still frantically trying to figure this out? What direction do they go from here? Uh, I think the best way to go about it is try to find out every place you see every character. Yeah. I think that's a good place to start so you can kind of realize how the characters are all intertwined, you know, make how they're sure related. a really good example is the deputy being the same deputy that gets bit. You know, you got to make right. sure that you know, you know, where the characters lie in the town and in the story. And then I guess another thing is to just kind of speculate what may have happened between the blackouts. Yeah. Right. Uh, if you see the stuff from the blackouts, mm-hmm. you know, how much of that you've seen and what you haven't. Right. Also good to write out a list of questions of shit that doesn't make sense right from the beginning and see how you can fill right. uh, a lot of that in. I had to go as far as to narrow down members of the cast to figure out uh, some of the mysteries of this thing. I think your advice about the characters is spot on. I think that would be the first place I'd go. You know, question what are the loyalties and motivations of each character? Yeah. Uh, his, I guess it's probably Jake's past love interest the woman he meets at the diner Mm -hmm. just so much of the body language is telling about that you know when he walks in there and he extends his hand to shake her hand she looks a little disappointed but uh, you know by the end of the series you find out from that weird phone call still don't know who's on the end of that that phone call 
uh, talking about, oh, he doesn't know. So she's kind of in on something. Although her actions seem endearing towards Jake, they seem like maybe she's trying to warn him, maybe she's protecting herself. Um, this paper she works for, I mean, what is that about? Right. To look at each one of those characters, Emil Hartman is another one. What does that guy want? Yeah. You know, he's shining the light in his eyes. He knows something. Just looking at each and every character and saying, what do they know and what do they want to get out of this Jake situation? What is their end goal with that? And then, of course, there's just other places to go now. There's that website I mentioned, at brightfalls.blogspot.com, a lot of stuff on there. And there's discussions on the forum and a lot of different stuff you can find by Googling around there. That's a pretty fucking thick episode God damn. we just uh, loaded in there. I am surprised we made through it without descending into darkness. Yeah, what, wow. do we, what do we do now? Let's do something funnier. Let's do something lighthearted. All right. We have a website that's pretty fucking funny. It's doublefeatureshow.com. You can write us an email, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. I'm pretty strung out on The Shining, but God damn, if you want to talk to me about Bright Falls, I am 100% into that. Do you want me to forward you all the emails about The Shining? Would you yeah, like I'll to- cover The Shining. I would love to cover The Shining. Are you? You're giving me sarcastic eyes. No, but I'm people serious. can't hear it on the. I would adore. Are you just going to write everybody back an email coverages. to say no, nope, really, ghosts? Is that... I, that well, I mean, I'll have that as an auto response, okay, and then I'll great. follow up on the ones that that I need to follow up on. All right, great. So it's set then. Uh, we got to find something lighter to do next time. What's uh, what's sitting there in the queue? What do you want to do? Some jokes. Let's do uh, kiss, kiss, bang, bang, and the invention of lying. I don't know if those are lighter movies, but they're certainly comedic movies. Yes. That's going to be another heavy show for us. Look forward to another long one, I think. Fantastic. Watch more fucking film. Bye.